So we should now be live. Yes, I see a large number of participants. Good morning, everyone. I'll just give a moment for everyone to connect. Right. Plenty of people filtering in for fairly early on a, on a whatever morning it is, Tuesday morning. See, I'm already losing track. Okay, uh, numbers have stabilized, so I think we can start. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Owen Appleton. Uh, I'm from EGI uh, and I work on the EOS Cub project and also the EOSC Enhance project, um, as well as having various other hats. Uh, welcome to this session, how can I onboard my service into the EOSC portal? Uh, I am your session chair, uh, so I will do an introduction and then I will do a little talk later on. Uh, just to make sure everyone's in the right room, I think this is the only room going in the conference uh, this morning. Uh, this is the plenary session, so hopefully you're all here for the right reasons. Uh, right, a little bit of housekeeping as ever. Um, the sessions are recorded, uh, the recording light is on, so please uh, be aware of what you say. Uh, the recordings will be made available after um, the conference, which I think is very useful, especially for some of the information we're going to give today. We have chosen to make this meeting, uh, this call, the meeting mode in, um, in Zoom, which puts a little bit more trust on all of you. Uh, in that you have to stay muted, <laughs> uh, but it does mean that you can see who else is in the call and you can see the chat together, which I think is is pretty useful. Um, because I think the interactions that we get in these calls are really a lot of the value. Uh, please ask your questions in the chat. Um, I will try and collate the questions uh, as we go through for, for some time at the end. Although if there are specific questions on uh, each talk, we'll try and give a little bit of time after each one to just answer anything specific. Anything we don't get to, um, please be confident we will try and uh, cover afterwards asynchronously. I think we'll all, we would all be available by email to ask other questions. Right, so uh, getting into the actual talk, uh, this session is called, my computer works, how can I onboard my service into the EOS portal? which is interesting because the first thing I'm going to do is critique the title of my own talk. <laughs> uh, bear with me for just a second. Um, I think this is a very reasonable title to see for the, the content we're gonna see here presented, but there are some things that have changed in the community. And I think that these changes should be recognized as we move forward. This is really how we've described things going uh, in the past and now they'll change a little. The first is that I think we have to start talking about stop talking about EOSC portal. Uh, this gives people the impression that EOSC is a website. EOSC is not a website. EOSC is an ecosystem and a community. That community includes some very interesting platforms. This uh, this includes some some interesting platforms, of which one is the one that's behind EOSC portal. EOSC portal is important, but it's a website. It's a view on what goes on within EOSC. Uh, when we over focus on the portal itself. Uh, we tend to have misunderstandings. So I think this is an important place to start. Um, also, it suggests that there is a single entry into EOSC, which is we're going to hear from Carson Thiel, from CESDA and Shock Next. It's not true. There are portals for many communities. Also, I think, although it says, how can I onboard my services, I would hear probably substitute in resource. I'll talk about this a bit more in a minute, but it's a when I when I get to my talk, I think now we try to broaden the idea of what are the elements we're bringing into EOSC. And certainly services are not the only thing we're bringing. And there are many, many other important elements which we have to have in order to make EOSC work. And finally, I think uh, on board is a term that's been used a lot. I know some communities like it less. Connect might well be a better, better way of talking about it because we're not talking about taking you people who were outside EOSC and bringing you in. There's no question that the thematic clusters are EOSC projects and we're already in EOSC. It's about connecting their resources together. This isn't some exclusive club that you're on the outside until you go through this process. It's about stitching together the existing community in a more effective way. And with that in mind, uh, we want to announce some good news in this regard. And that's really what this session is about, which is three things really, all of which will be covered by the talks today. 
Um, new EOS provider and resource profiles, this is version three. This is the way we within uh, EOS Carbon, EOS Enhance and elsewhere describe providers and their resources. So it's kind of the metadata schema. This will be presented uh, by me briefly later. Uh, a new provider portal, which allows for self-service connecting of providers and resources and an updated EOS marketplace on the EOS portal website. All of these things are progress, which I think there's been a lot of people waiting for for a long time. So hopefully this will be uh, something that goes down well with all of you. These are the talks that we will have in order to, to, to get to that point. First, we'll have Carsten Thiel from Sesta and Shock. He'll be talking about really the top end of the pipeline. How do projects like the thematic clusters like Shock go from having a whole bunch of deliverables to some idea of services, which they could connect somewhere. Uh, and I think other resources as well. So I think this is a good place to start. I will then introduce the provider and resource pro pro uh, profiles and the sort of very high level uh, view of the, of the onboarding process as it's been called now, I guess, connecting process, we could call it. George Papastephanos from um, EOSC Enhance will talk about the provider portal and how this allows you to connect. And then lastly, Bartosz Wilk from Cyphernet and uh, EOS Cub and Enhance will give us a, a view of the new, the new upgraded marketplace. So given there's all these new things happening, there's one other um, kind of point I wanted to make, which is we need feedback. And if you look on the new pages within the portal, if you look on the provider portal, so this is the four providers button and everything you get to from there. If you look in the marketplace part, you will see on the right hand side a new little button that says provide feedback and if you click this button you will get a feedback form uh, this is only a basic feedback form but for this initial stage where we're launching quite a few things at once we wanted to give people the direct opportunity to give feedback on things that work that don't work that are broken that are missing uh, there's always going to be teething problems with new systems so please in the next couple of weeks uh, can you make frequent use of this button if you have something specific you want to get through to the people developing these these platforms this will really help us a lot in making sure that they meet your needs okay um that's the end of of my initial introduction so now i will pass over to uh, to carsten thiel uh, he's the, the technical director i believe of, of sesda and is a uh, an important player in the shock community as well as the larger infrastructure community so carsten do you want to present your slides i will stop sharing from my side yes thank you um desktop two there we go yeah so just after owen uh, decided to open the entire uh, topic again i'm going back to talking specifically about services and specifically about listing them in in the portal but i'll also explain a bit on why this is the focus of this talk and where it relates to the other things owen just mentioned so the shock project um, many of you might have heard about it already uh, in particular yesterday uh, is one of the five cluster projects with 48 partners a 40 month project for 14,000, uh, 14 million euros. Um, quite a big project. It's the social sciences part of the European Open Science Cloud. We have um, Shock as the way we're combining both the technical side, the e-infrastructures, tools, marketplace and innovation, but also on the other side, research data, training, governments, the human aspect of it, uh, combining all of this into the EOSC and then building on top of this our own view on the social science and humanities researchers that they can then access the specific services that are relevant for them. Shock is to some extent a network. Um, we have lots of different institutions in the Shock project. It's from research uh, institutions, e-infrastructures. Uh, we also have private companies. We're liaising with policymakers. We have civil societies. We have citizen scientists. We have a lot of researchers directly embedded also in the project through the research organizations, and now also a research initiative in its own right. Um, universities, of course, libraries, um, in particular on the training. Now, with such a big project, some of the key numbers are that we have 101 deliverables and 49 milestones over the course of 40 months. 
So this is more than one milestone per month on average, although don't be fooled by the average because a lot of these milestones are reached simultaneously, like halfway through and towards the end. The same, of course, goes for deliverables. 101 deliverables are not evenly distributed, um, as is the case with almost all projects. Now, deliverables, classically, we're talking a lot about reports and we're talking about demonstrators, which in many cases is what's the official term for a software service that you're actually building. But the demonstrator or the report is just something that you deposit somewhere or publish somewhere. In our case, that's Zenodo, um, but it might also be other publication platform. But it's something that comes out and is a object that then resides somewhere for citation or for proof of work done. And the milestones, they're more of the steps along the project roadmap. It's kind of the checkpoints to make sure that we are on progress but it's also a very uh, intangible object or uh, objects in that sense that we don't necessarily get immediate feedback out of uh, reaching a milestone. We may have milestones that are upgrades of services, uh, and this is something we can communicate and the users can see, but how that relates to onboarding to the marketplace, uh, the, the shock port, the EOS portal, is something we have to look into. So. As I said, some of these are, some of these deliverables built towards new services or upgrading existing services. We have cases where we take services that have been developed for one of the specific infrastructures or domains and now making them available uh, and compatible with a more broader sense in for all of social sciences and humanities. We've gone through the process of defining our services and tools timeline. This is available from the Shock website. Um, it's kind of a roadmap that shows us which services, tools, products become available at what point over the project time. And here you also see there's a large number of things happening between January 2022 and April 2022 which is only the last four months of the project and the first 36 months of the project uh, are almost as many um, uh, dots in this graph. Um, so this means we have to prepare for the fact that many things will become available only at the very end of the project. Now I said there's deliverables, but we also need to talk about services. Um, Tangible versus intangible. I said the deliverables are things you can deposit somewhere. Now, a PDF might not be as tangible as a physical publication in form of a book, but still you have a door, you can cite it, um, it's, it's available. Whereas a service is more something that's continually provided to you. Uh, the additional benefit that you have from accessing a specific product maybe. And going back to the definition from EOSC Hub, um, on what a production service for EOS means. Some of the core requirements are stable and reliable software. Uh, within SESDA, we've worked for quite some years in defining on what we understand as a reliable software and how we measure whether something is a reliable software. You also have to provide documentation and user support to the users of your services, have some form of terms of use or even an SLA and provide evidence that your service has users and the use is consistent with the expectation of those users and that it actually satisfies their needs. So these are things that when thinking of in terms of a project where you're writing a deliverable several months in advance saying we're gonna propose or produce a software that will allow a user to do X and Y, that's a far step, far, several steps away from being able to show that these are, that they're actually users using the service to do research and that the things that the software can do actually enable the user to use the service in a way that meets the expectations. Um, so the things we've been recently going through is identifying what are these services because some of the things you've seen on the roadmap are in fact just some of the major 
deliverables. Um, there are a lot of training materials that is just material. I say just material. Of course, there's a lot of work in producing this material, but the actual service and training is delivering the training, teaching people, not just handing out slides. Um, so we have to define what are our services and we have to define who are the technical and the content contacts. This is the terminology we're using within SESTA. The technical person is the one or the technical contact is the one who's responsible for this uh, stable, reliable software part. Whereas the content person is reliable for documentation, support, ensuring that the service actually meets what the users need which also means talking to the users on finding users sometimes. And one of the most important problems with projects is what's gonna happen to this service once the project is over? Um, at the very lowest level, the people working for the project may not have fun or may not have their positions after the project ends. The grant, may pay for the server, the software, or the service is currently running on, but this will probably end with the end of the project. So what happens after the end of the project? In particular, if we're onboarding services that become available one month before the end of the project, um, if we then have to turn take it back out of EOSC one month later, this is really not a good solution. So we're looking already now into the question of what will be the future governance for these services, who will take care of them in both the technical sense, but also taking care of the user in the user sense. Uh, and what's gonna be the business model? Is it just the Eric paying for the service and maintaining it? Or will there be a paid model in some way or another, all of the options that EOSC um, is also providing? And of course, now that the new portal is online, we'll start uh, onboarding the first services because over this, this summer, several first candidates have become available that we're now starting with. And the other side is how this will look to the social science researchers and humanities researchers. For this, we're building the SSH Open Marketplace. It's a discovery portal for social sciences and humanities resources. And here we go back to Owens mention of it's not just about the services. Um, because for a service to be an EOS, you have to satisfy all these requirements, you have to provide uh, support and so on. But in social science humanities, sometimes a simple Python script that's available somewhere on GitHub might still be worth mentioning. It comes with a very different level of quality and guarantees, but it's still not irrelevant. So what the SSH marketplace will offer is a list of tools and services, also training materials, data sets, publications, and even workflows to connect all of these together. It's designed along the three guiding principles of contextualization, curation, and community. And these are very important because what we're doing is we're taking existing uh, resources or existing description of software and of other things from existing sources. That includes TAPRO, it includes the programming historian, the standardization survival kit, the switchboard, which is one of those cases where Clarine uh, and Eric for the linguistics started building this tool several years ago and as the part of shock, it's now being extended to cover also social sciences and broader range of humanities disciplines. Digital humanities conference papers, publications in a classical sense, and of course, the EOS portal marketplace. Our view is that we will be harvesting from all of these sources, but there will be a manual curation flow, which goes back to what I just said earlier with the curation and with the community. Um, there will be people deciding which of the services that we find in the EOSC uh, portal, but also on all of these other sources, are the ones we should really be listing. There may also be questions of deduplication and so on involved in this, but it's mostly on making sure that we're filtering the right services. Because for us, onboarding a service to EOSC and in the sense of listing it in the portal is very important to make it available generically. But we also think that if you're seeing too many mentionings of uh, let's say satellite dishes, 
that won't you get you too far if you're trying to analyze your survey data or your linguistic corpus. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Carsten. Uh, I think that was really interesting um, and makes me, uh, should we say, from the EOSC core side where I mostly sit, um, as should we say, more optimistic and cheerful because it's nice to see that the same concepts are be definitely being developed in the cluster communities as well as in the, the more EOSC core development work. And I think we're all facing certainly the same challenges. Okay, uh, I will switch back to, to me talking for now. Uh, I didn't see any um, specific questions for casting during that time, but please do feel free to use the, the chat uh, to, to add any questions you have. Just make sure I can see them as well. Oh, no, I can't. Okay, um, so back to me. Uh, having had the introduction, having seen where you get to having services and now other resources as well, and I admit I dropped this distinction on cast and sort of unprepared, but I think clearly he was thinking in the same direction. Now I want to talk about what do we actually have to do to describe these resources and to connect them to EOSC? Obviously, this is the, the next step. Uh, I'm going to give sort of the high level uh, part of this, and then we'll get into more detail in the next two talks. I'll just check my time as well. Um, so first, there is this resource-centric view, which, uh, which we've been talking about. I think that uh, it's worth explaining why we get to it, why we talk about something a little bit more than just services. I think we have to accept that there have been at least two, in fact, many more narratives in the community in the past, which we have seen. At one extreme, you find something a bit like everything is fair data. That's the, the, the vehicle through which we must access and, and conceptualize what we do in EOSC. From other sides, everything is a service. And I think that a bit like sort of nature versus nurture in the sciences, both of these are clearly wrong. The answer is inevitably somewhere between the two. And in fact, I think it's more complicated than that. If you start talking to people from the open science community, from open air, they very quickly are going to ask you, well, where did you put publications in this? Is a publication just data or is it something different? Uh, plus, um, again, Carsten mentioned uh, when you're talking about whether a service is production ready having stable software. Well, the software itself is somehow not just a, a data set, like an experimental data set, but it's something we have to consider. Training, again, was already mentioned, is incredibly important. If we have all these different kinds of entity within EOSC, uh, very quickly we come to the question, how do we deal with them? Do we write separate rules for each kind of entity? Are there training rules of participation and software rules of participation and data rules of participation? Or do we list them in separate portals or catalogs? And for me, all of this, uh, the answer is no, <laughs> from my point of view at least. In order for EOS to work, we have to have the greatest commonality we can to offer, be able to offer some added value to the researchers that we're all trying to support. So when Shock look at dealing with the social sciences and humanities community, I very much imagine if they have someone who's looking for um, a service which is about somehow annotating text, they would quite like to see software that, that would go with that service or conference papers which are potentially linked to that. And in order to make these connections, we have to consider all these things really in a more integrated way. So we are going to have some sort of categorization. I think we have to talk about at least services, research products, by which I would mean data and software and several, several other things, and training resources. But personally, and I think a lot of what we've been doing in the last year has been putting a layer over the top of these, which we just call resources. And any time that we can make the rules or the procedures or the approach based on all resources, rather than the different categories within it, we should. This doesn't mean we don't recognize differences between them. There are things you would ask about for a data set that you certainly wouldn't ask about for a service. Again, as we've heard, services are live things, so they're somewhat intangible. They require people to constantly be performing activities to keep them working a well deposited data set that's well annotated and in a good repository could possibly sit there for 10 years untouched and still be very valuable. But if we can if we can find the commonality first, I think that's definitely the way to go. And then we can break down into these categories and even subcategories. There are many kinds of service, data processing perhaps, but a, a, a data source, a repository is a form of service, uh, by which I mean a repository isn't the data in it, 
the data is, is, is contained within it, but the repository offers some level of service, whether it's thin or kind of more complicated and value adding. We often hear about sensitive data services and there are many, many other categories. Uh, these may need subcategory specific rules and approaches, but we can deal with the common parts first. The same is true of research products. We clearly have data sets, publication software, but there are many other categories. And I think training resources pretty much do merit their own uh, separate section in this as well. Um, certainly there are, there's the training content, you know, courses themselves, but there's also training syllabuses, quick start guides, architectural documents, standards. There's all sorts of different stuff which we may want to consider within this model. So when we talk about um, what we're doing within EOSC, I think it's better that we take this point of view of resources. It's certainly built into the EOSC future proposal to some extent. So the, the next phase of what's running the core of EOSC um, pending the negotiation with the European Commission will just to, to the extent we can take this view. And this is what we're trying to do in terms of connecting resources as well. That said, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the vast majority of the effort so far is sitting on the services part of this, because this is what the projects that have contributed to EOS Portal up to now have focused on. So right now we are connecting essentially services only to EOSC. As I will mention in a little bit, we have plans to expand that more fully to, to include other kinds of entity, but we're not quite there yet. That work is in progress. So um, if you want to connect your services to EOSC, what's the sort of very high level view of that? Uh, I think this diagram, once I talk you through it, will provide some uh, reasonable information. As ever, this starts with uh, someone making an account somewhere. Uh, and this will be mentioned, I think, by George, but from now on, the, the, the access method for bringing your provider and your resources to EOSC will start with having to register an account using some sort of AI that works with EOSC. There are many options here, and if, if you can't find one, we'll try and help you to find one, but that is gonna be the first step. And now, rather than just asking people to onboard a resource, we're going to ask them first to onboard a provider. So in order to save quite a lot of effort, which in the past was duplicated with every resource, first you will uh, describe a provider, give a bunch of information about that and submit that to um, the EOSC uh, core team, should we say. It will be checked. Um, the information will be checked. You know, is it kind of basically of decent quality? Also the appropriateness of, of providers will be checked. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail because it'll be covered later as well, but two checks, which I think uh, are, are worth mentioning. One is, are you trying to sell Louis Vuitton handbags or other counterfeit goods? Because um, that it does make up a significant portion of the mails which your support has received up to now for, for onboarding in the past. So there are some just straight rejections of kinds of organization that we can't see would ever really be fitting with EOSC. If you're trying to sell jewelry or handbags, chances are you're not really in the area we're talking about. However, another check which goes to the sustainability angle that Carsten mentioned is we will be accepting providers that are legal entities. Uh, so we won't be accepting projects as, as the provider of a, of, a, of a service or other resource. That doesn't mean projects can't be accommodated, they will be. Your project affiliation can be listed. This is in the data model, but in order to make sure that things are somewhat sustainable, we will ask that it's legal entities that do this onboarding. And this means that there is a far higher chance we can still contact them three to five years down the line than a project which inevitably will finish and the contacts may all disappear. So this is one of the steps we're making to try and deal with sustainability. So once a provider is, has submitted their information and they've been approved, they are able to uh, describe resources. Uh, these, this uses some, some uh, well, previously it was unpleasant templates in Google Docs or other systems. Now it's a very nice looking online portal. You're able to describe your resources. Most of the description is quite generic, as I'll mention in a minute. There are some parts which are quite specific to certain kinds of resource, certainly to services. We haven't gone to the service subcategory specific parts yet. Um, and, the, uh, and yeah, I think this is also something that can be achieved either by using an online form or via API. And George will talk about this more later. These will then be checked again by the EOS core team. The way it's set up now 
Um, once your provider is approved, we will check your first resource in detail and it has to be positively approved. After that, you will essentially be able to self-publish and we will have to check post facto uh, what it is you've uploaded. This is subject to change. This is a somewhat a learning, uh, learning experience for all of us because it depends on the volume of, of services and other resources to be connected, which might be very, very high. Um, so we're trying to, to allow for scaling effectively. But um, just be aware that this is something which is a little bit subject to change depending on the kind of content that's submitted. But the better content you all submit, the less of a problem this is going to be. And here we will check whether resources match the rules of participation and the inclusion criteria for EOSC, which have been set out. Inclusion criteria I'll point out in a minute. And also, because we want to take resources directly from other communities like Shock, just since we've been talking about them, we won't be revalidating everything that Shock is submitting. However, we will be asking them to sign an agreement which says that they will provide a base level of validation that matches our minimum requirements. So we will have a function to essentially audit content which we're automatically taking from other, other registries to make sure that those agreements are still in place and are being effectively delivered upon. This is really the only way we can see to avoid constant revalidation of resources which we know won't work. And then the really neat bit, and this is certainly something new, the publication step from this, once a resource is approved, is now much, much easier. It's essentially fully automatic. Things which are approved in this provider portal in this backend registry will appear in the EOSC marketplace. There are extra steps which the marketplace team can perform to enable ordering and other added value benefits on top of just being listed. But basically, this is far, far less painful than it used to be and far more instant. So that's the, the very high level process. I'll let the others go into this in more detail in the subsequent talks. But the only other thing I want to talk about is what is the format with which we request people describe their providers and resources. And these are the so-called EOSC profiles. Um, it's essentially a metadata scheme, a metadata schema for describing providers and resources. Uh, it's already in use now by EOSC Hub, EOSC Enhance and Open Air to an extent, although that's still coming online now. And it, we've essentially mapped the various schemes for describing things that we had in other projects. So in EOSC Hub, in uh, InfraCentral as well in the past, um, and some, some input from the communities as well, to come up with uh, a consensus schema for describing our services. It's open to others. I mean, it's, it's Creative Commons, and we would hope that this empowers EOSC registries. So it will be used in EOSC Future, which will continue pretty much straight on from what EOSC Hub and EOSC Enhance are doing here. And it's available for the communities as well, like Shock or Escape or Panos or any of the other thematic communities or the, the regional ones as well. We wouldn't necessarily assume they have to use exactly the schema. They're free to, of course, but this allows for them to map to this schema, even if they don't use it. So the translation between them is possible. And um, we would basically focus on the required fields. One thing you'll see is that there are a lot of optional fields in this scheme because we're trying to accommodate many, many different use cases. And that means that <clears throat> um, there is a base set of data we're always going to need. And that's what I think I would encourage people to focus on. And then the extensions with the, the, the optional data is, should we say, lower priority. Um, if you want to see them, there is now, uh, as of a couple of days ago, a provider documentation page on EOS portal. You can see the link here, eosportal.eu slash providers dash documentation. Here, there are sections on both the provider and resource profiles. And I have put some tiny URL links for the um, uh, for, for a PDF and an Excel of this data, if you want to have a look yourself. The PDF is formatted more as a specification, so it's a very long text document. The Excel file is a little easier to, to manage if you want to have a quick look. Um, I can always pop these back up and, and put them in the chat later as well. But if you want to have a look, this is where they are. In terms of their structure, um, they kind of are structured quite similarly. The provider profile has six kind of subsections, um, basic information, you know, what's the name of the provider, really standard stuff, information related more to marketing, so explaining who you are to the outside world, logos, use cases, things like this, classification information, so this is what kind of organization you are, what scientific domain do you serve, 
Are you a physical or a virtual organization? Um, information about where providers are, how mature they are, where they are in their life cycle, and then there is a large amount of optional additional information as well. And um, the this then is the, the provider profile. So once you've, you've connected your provider, you can use them for as many resources as you like. You can also be associated with resources where you are not the lead provider. This is a function which is very useful for federated uh, services which have been delivered. The resource profile looks very similar. Uh, it really has a lot of the same kind of uh, standard information, basic marketing, maturity information, classification. Uh, although here we have both uh, resource location information. Sorry, that's in classification is a little bit wider here because we have the kind of tool we're talking about. Um, there is a difference in how we talk about location because now we have to talk about the location of the resources which provide a resource and also the geographical area that it seeks to serve. Some resources can only serve some countries or regions. Some of them are European bound, some of them are worldwide. We also have to cover things like language. Uh, we talk about dependencies. Are there, do you have to have other resources already um, accessible in order to use this one? Uh, we have contact information, of course. Attribution is interesting. This allows you to be able to cite the project or the funding source which supports a resource, which we know is something that funding agencies are very keen on. Uh, and also, obviously, you need to know how to access and order it, and you need to know any financial considerations which are attached to it. In terms of how it looks inside, I don't have time to go through this in, in great detail, but I'll just give you an example. I don't expect you to read this necessarily on the screen, but if you go to the links from my previous slides, then uh, you'll be able to see yourself. For each field, so this is the basic information section for resources, um, there is uh, a name for a field, there is an ID, so there's a code which you can use to retrieve it, um, there are values, there are definitions of what it is, there's a type, so is this uh, a yes no question, is this asking for uh, a string, is this asking for some sort of ID from elsewhere, uh, how many bits of information do we do we request, for instance here, we only request one name for a, for a resource, that's fine, but you can have multiple providers because there may be many organizations that contribute to it. Uh, we specify whether it's required, as in is this a, a mandatory field, and whether it would be made public. There is some information which would be requested but not made public. For instance, security contacts in case there's some sort of breach or security incident. This is definitely something we need, but it's not something we need to give to everyone in the world. So this is uh, kind of roughly what the structure looks like. I encourage you to go and look at it yourself. You'll definitely come across it if you try and connect your resources with your providers. And I also want to point out that really of all of this, only one section is probably highly service specific, and that's probably the management information down here. So the rest of it is already in, you know, in reflecting and going through it in the last week or so, pretty generic to all kinds of resource. Um, this is something that we are going to have to trim and tweak in future. But uh, I think we've already made a good start in being able to have a, a profile which covers all resources and then consider what are the additional things we need to ask for specific resource types. Um, certainly, we, we don't want you to have to fill in so many fields when onboarding a, a paper, connecting a paper as a service, but we have to consider um, just quite how to manage this. And indeed, I think this is pretty much the last thing I want to say. Um, where does this profile, where is it going? So we've now released version three. Um, version three is the provider pro profile and a resource profile which is focused on general services rather than any particular subtype. So we know this isn't the end of the story. This is this is a release we had to get out to, to merge the existing sources of data we had. Uh, so it probably has gone through less consultation than, than you might like as the communities, but we had to get something together first and make sure we could merge the data we had into it. We now certainly definitely will want a lot of feedback on it and we'll be organizing various channels to get that in the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, I would expect early next year, these, these dates are not set because these things are still in discussion, but I think it's very realistic, at least the first extension to this schema for data sources. So for data repositories, this is something we're working with open air very closely on to work out what is the delta between what we already have and what they collect on data sources and repositories. So we will start to introduce uh, additional fields, uh, which would generally, which would be optional because they're not required for all resources. Um, and this would be something like the first quarter of next year, um, if the work continues at the pace. 
And then I think you can expect to see in the second half of next year, version four of these profiles, where we really break things down more into services, into resource uh, product, uh, research products, so it's a typo, and into training resources. This is something that we need to do before the end of the EOS Enhance project for sure, but it will take a little bit more work, but we definitely want to be in a position that, that we can be onboarding other kinds of resources as soon as we possibly can, but there are, there are challenges there too. Okay, um, I'm going to stop there pretty much on time because Carsten was quite quick. Uh, I'm going to pass on now to uh, George Papastephanos, who's going to talk about uh, how you'll actually do this, uh, which I think you'll be happy to see if any of you have experienced the pain that was the previous version of this process. Uh, so <laughs> it's been well reviewed so far. Um, I will check the chat for questions uh, in a moment, although I don't, uh, there are some, but I'll probably have to get to them a little bit later on. For now, I think I'll, I'll pass over to George. So George, if you want to share your screen. Yes, uh, thank you, Owen. Let me share my presentation. Give me just. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, hello to all. Hi, everybody. I think you can see my screen now. I can start. Yes, great. So my name is uh, George Papastefanatos. Uh, I work for uh, EOSC Enhance uh, from University of Athens. For you that you may not have uh, heard the, the project, it's a two-year project that is actually uh, working on contributing to the EOSC portal, to the maintenance and the development of uh, new functionality in the EOSC portal, along with EOSC Hub and Open Advance. Uh, so today I I'll just uh, try to provide you an overview uh, to the new uh, provide the section of the EOSC uh, portal um, and the functionality that uh, it will offer. Uh, to provide this to the user coming from affiliation who would like to provide resources in the portal. Uh, what you can do actually, uh, in the current functionality, the, a user can actually onboard resources in the EOS portal. It follows uh, this workflow that Owen uh, described before. Uh, also, it can manage and it can uh, have uh, full control on the onboarded resources and the information regarding the provider. And also use the APIs for uh, automatically and programmatically uh, interacting uh, with the catalog of resources. Uh, I will provide an overview of these three main functionalities and uh, you can always go in and test yourselves in the link that uh, I, uh, is uh, visible uh, in the slide. So about the onboarding process, uh, Owen showed that there is a workflow which is followed, which uh, actually is performed uh, within the portal. And uh, we can say that uh, it has three distinct phases, three distinct uh, steps. The first is that uh, a user who would like to offer resources, onboard resources in the portal must be registered. Uh, second, must uh, actually uh, provide information about the organization that provides resources. And at the last step, provide a first template about a resource uh, that will be, uh, let's say, part of its portfolio. These steps, these three steps, actually uh, are followed and uh, there is an interaction between the representative and the onboarding team of the EOS portal. And after these three steps, uh, the representative can uh, actually uh, onboard more resources and uh, be part of the EOS uh, portal catalog. So let's see uh, how these steps are performed within the portal, within the web interface. Uh, first of all, the start of this uh, journey is uh, through the EOS portal. There is a, a, a section that uh, asks for providers to visit. And uh, from the, that point, uh, 
uh, a provider, a user can click on the apply now button. And if it's not, if the provider, the user is not, uh, let's say, logged in, then uh, it, he or she is redirected to the AAI of the EOS portal and um, logged, logs in. Uh, the AAI uh, asks for credentials, either academic or social uh, credentials uh, a user can use. Um, and uh, when the user logs in, then the next screen is uh, the first screen of the registration forms. Uh, what we ask uh, in the beginning is for the representative to, let's say, assert authorization to uh, verify that uh, she agrees to the EOS code of contact, to the EOS portal privacy policy, and to the authorization uh, of representation of the provider organization, that the user actually is an authorized representative. This is self, uh, let's say, asserted, but actually there is a communication with, uh, through emails for the moment, uh, which are sent uh, to users and uh, actually validate that uh, uh, each step uh, has been uh, performed. So the first, uh, after the uh, authorization, the user must uh, fill in information about the provider. These actually forms are uh, based on the uh, new model on the EUSC profiles and organize all basic information, all information into categories, into sections. Um, all mandatory fields are denoted with an asterisk and uh, there is uh, a validation and there are different validations in the fields uh, such that users can, uh, let's say, more easily fill in uh, all the necessary information. Uh, after all this information is uh, filled in, uh, the submit button is enabled and uh, the user can go actually to the next step. Uh, there are uh, also, uh, uh, there is a button and uh, links uh, in, in the page uh, for users to actually submit the feedback or ask for help. And also there is a, a mail list onboarding at EOS portal uh, where the user can actually send or contact uh, the team behind this onboarding process. Uh, George, one, before you go on, uh, we see your presenter view, if you want to switch the, the view type. Um, okay. Just makes it bigger for people on small screens. I think you can just hit uh, in the display settings at the top, switch views. Um, is it okay now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, great. So the, upon submission, the uh, representative is, uh, will be navigated to the My Providers page. This is actually uh, a dashboard where a user can see the uh, organization they represent. The uh, organization are organized in, the, the affiliation organized in, let's say, blocks. And uh, the status of the new uh, registration is, uh, let's say, in a pending uh, state uh, and as we said before what is pending is actually the onboarding team to validate the information this is a necessary step uh, for a team to let's say um, validate that this information is according to what EUSC is uh, actually expects uh, after this step the onboarding team reviews and approves the provider profile and this is uh, actually, when uh, the last phase, the registration of, uh, of resources is enabled. So uh, at each step, as I said before, uh, an email is sent that reminds, uh, let's say, that uh, the, the next step is available, is open for uh, filling in the resource information. So at this step, the uh, form for uh, registering for filling in information about the resource, again, based on the new profile, is enabled. Uh, there are two different options. Uh, the first has actually enables to fill in information through the web form. And the second option is to use the API. 
Uh, again, the web forms organize all this information uh, on the blocks, on the different blocks on the ES profiles. They offer validations uh, for the mandatory fields for different uh, data uh, formats. And uh, the user can actually submit the information when all, at least all mandatory fields are filled in. Uh, again, there is the option to save a draft, let's say save uh, the, 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 the information for filling in the next uh, stage, but still the submission is enabled uh, only when the mandatory fields and all the necessary information is filled in. Uh, the review and the approval is again performed by the onboarding team. And uh, after this uh, step, actually the resource and the organization is approved uh, as a valid provider in the use portal. And the information of the resource is available in the marketplace. This is where, let's say, the cycle, the, the process, this process ends. And the next, let's say, step for the provider, especially when there are more resources to board, is to have access to the provider dashboard. The provider dashboard is actually the workspace where the users from the provider can manage their resources. The uh, dashboard is again accessible through the section for providers in the EU portal. There is a link in the menu that uh, asks, that says my provider. And this link takes the user to the dashboard where um, some where more actions are enabled. So the main uh, page of the dashboard is uh, where the user actually um, sees the status of the provider. Uh, as we said before, there are different status, uh, but the more common uh, status is that the provider is approved and can onboard resources. Uh, by clicking on uh, the organ to the organization, to the provider uh, link, uh, there is uh, uh, the provider dashboard where the user can actually have access to statistics about uh, user statistics or other types of statistics about the resources that are onboarded by uh, this organization. Can view an, in a list all resources, both the resources that are approved and are public in the marketplace, as well as any other draft resources that are, uh, let's say, uh, onboarded, registered, but are not public can add new resources, can update the provider information, and of course, uh, uh, can I actually um, make some resources not public on everything that has to do with management of resources. Uh, as we said before, there are different statistics about usage, uh, about uh, user views in the marketplace. Uh, these statistics can be visualized in uh, uh, maps or in other uh, time series charts. Uh, and uh, there is a full control over the list of resources that are provided by this organization. Um, a user can uh, view details about the information uh, that is provided about this resource, can deactivate, make it, uh, let's say, not public, uh, or uh, can also delete and remove from the catalog. For the moment, these are the options. These are the actions that are offered for uh, users in, uh, in the catalog, for users from the provider. Finally, there is a, a view on uh, the, the updates, on the changes, uh, on, let's say, based on the versions. The, the catalog, uh, let's say, tracks all updates that are performed by users uh, that, let's say, uh, manage the information from a provider. So uh, any user can actually see and have uh, access to this uh, timeline, let's say, about the evolution of a resource in the catalog. So the last thing about the uh, functionality of a provider has to do with the APIs. 
The APIs offer, uh, let's say, the programmatic uh, uh, way, the programmatic uh, methods uh, for users to uh, register or access the catalog. Uh, the as let's say API actually all API methods are uh, REST REST um, uh, RESTful uh, web services. Uh, there is an, uh, the documentation and it follows uh, the open API specifications. And uh, there is the documentation in these links and the providers.eoscorpal.eu uh, uh, slash developers. And uh, also there is a mail list uh, that could be, let's say, um, used for contact for uh, the API issues. Uh, so for using the APIs, uh, uh, the first thing is for the representative, the user to uh, actually onboard and to look to have an active uh, provider, uh, to have already register a provider and a resource. Uh, we use API tokens and for that uh, we uh, actually use the uh, AAI functionality for generating uh, tokens that could be used for uh, all methods used by the provider uh, users. Uh, and let's see how we can actually obtain an API token. Uh, an API token, uh, all this information is uh, documented in, in the link uh, for the provider API documentation. Uh, the user uh, actually must log in and uh, receive a, a token, which is, let's say, valid for uh, eight, hour, uh, eight hours. After this expiration, a new one must be obtained. And this token could be used either uh, for test reasons in the uh, documentation page, in the Swagger page that we uh, expose, or uh, in the headers of the methods that um, we, we use, we offer. Uh, for the API methods, for the moment, there is uh, a simple way to uh, use uh, the API. Uh, all API methods are offered um, through uh, SSL, and the base uh, URL for the all API methods is the api.eosportal.eu. Uh, its method follows this um, API. For instance, this method that asks for uh, that asks for getting all resources within the catalog uh, is api is you can see here uh, the uh, request um, url uh, the um, uh, format is uh, json but there is the option in the header to ask for other formats like xml all methods are organized in the two let's say main controllers the information for the provider and for the resource. Uh, we have get methods to retrieve information, post methods to create and add information, and put methods to update information. Uh, as I said before, all of these, at least the post and put methods needs the, the, the authorized um, the API token. Uh, and as uh, uh, an example, um, the uh, information, especially for the post and the put methods, are based on the EOS profiles, the model uh, that is now uh, available. And this is why the version of the API is called API 3.0. So all examples are available in the Open API documentation in Swagger format. Uh, as a, some example you can see here, there is um, the, um, the get provider method uh, returns the EOS provider profile with a given provider ID. The get resource gets a resource ID and again retrieves the description in JSON format of the, uh, of the specific resource. There is an option to retrieve uh, all the resources in the catalog to post uh, a new resource or to put uh, to update a, a new provider. For the moment, there is no option to add a new provider. To uh, register a new provider, this option is only possible through the uh, web interface. And the, the main reason for that is to, uh, let's say, assert and to approve 
the code of content and the privacy policy before registering a new provider. So I will not go into more details about the use of the APIs. This is just an overview. Um, you can take a look. Uh, this work is being performed and within the EOS Can Hans project and uh, I'll be happy to ask to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. Uh, that was that was very clear. Um, and <clears throat> so uh, there is one question in the in the chat, uh, which is about uh, if you're a commercial, if you're a software company, uh, what do you have to what do you have to do? What can you do? Asking about whether you actually have to deploy the service on EOS. No, in fact, you don't. Uh, the, the the resources or other services you connect, you can operate them yourself. I mean, that's the case for most uh, most situations. You don't have to use resources from EOSC in order to deploy your own services on top of them, although that is a possibility if you find a provider who's interested in doing that. Um, and the other thing which I think is perhaps more interesting to answer is that uh, the question was, once you've done this connecting, once you've done this onboarding, uh, will there be opportunities to integrate with other complementary services deployed on EOSC? Yes, this is actually a point which maybe I could have made earlier on. The, this onboarding, this connection of resources is the first step of integration with EOSC and certainly with EOSC core. So if you go through this process, you will be listed uh, and you will already be using an AI, which hopefully is compatible. There are a number of EOSC core services, things like um, AI, there's a help desk, monitoring, accounting, uh, various other kind of functionalities and capabilities which will be available for integration by providers. So you can use or connect to the AI that's there. You can use the monitoring or accounting for services that is there provided by EOSC and there will be advantages to this. Uh, so this is something which, uh, which will happen. It probably could have happened earlier, but the way the world has worked, everything has been a little bit delayed. Certainly I think we'll see this much more in EOSC future next year. Um, the deployment question I'll probably, probably lead to later because I want to give Bartosz uh, a chance to uh, to talk. However, I will answer one other question. Um, if our repository is already integrated on OpenAir, will we have to still go through this process? I don't know. <laughs> it depends whether OpenAir actually automatically uh, submits their corpus of resources to us. And I think there is a plan to do so, but we have to go through the technical details. But one really important thing to say, if you already onboarded your resource with EOSC Hub or with the InfraCentral project, it is already there. You will be asked to log in and basically check the data because there's have to be some translation of the data to a new format. Um, so there will probably be some errors, but we have taken a lot of time, particularly our colleagues at JNP have really put in a lot of work here and also at CypherNet to uh, move the data to the new format to the best extent we can, such that this is not a painful process to you, but it will require a check. Uh, the other questions, I'll, if, it, if it's okay, leave until, until after Bartosz has had a chance to talk in case it answers some of them, but we'll, we'll get to them in just a second. So now I shall pass over to Bartosz Wilk from, from CypherNet and he'll talk about the more uh, user-facing part of all of this. Thanks, Bartosz. Thank you, Owen. Uh, let me just uh, display the slides. Okay, I should be able to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, Owen. Mm, uh, my, name is, my name is Bartosz Wilk. Uh, I represent uh, Academic Computer Center Cytronet uh, at AGH in Krakow. Um, I also represent the projects EOSC Hub and EOSC Enhance. And I am the responsible person for the development of the EOSC Marketplace. Uh, taking the opportunity to present uh, you uh, our recent developments in the EOSC marketplace, I will try to uh, show you how we as EOSC community are creating uh, the, the EOSC um, and what is the role of the onboarding process as we are in the onboarding session right now. I will focus on the provider providers take on the role of the EOSC marketplace in this process. So let me um, just start with the short story of the EOSC portal. Um, 
sorry, I think I need to turn on the notifications. Okay, I'm free to go right now. Uh, some time ago, we launched uh, the EOSC portal. Uh, as you remember, uh, this was this was the initiative. Uh, it was brought to us by the European Commission, uh, who uh, who advised to uh, launch uh, a website and merge three catalogs of EOSC Hub uh, services: e Infra Central and Open Air services. Mm. So uh, we developed an initial architecture and merged uh, three, uh, three initiatives into a single catalog. Then uh, there was an evolution into the new EOS portal architecture and uh, three components of this architecture uh, were developed. So the content component being the website, user component being the uh, catalog and marketplace and the pro provider component being the main uh, contact point for the providers. Uh, then the EOSC Enhanced project started and, uh, and the uh, migration of the, uh, of the um, previously uh, collected uh, service description uh, templates and the provider inputs uh, were happening and and the EOSC onboarding process uh, has been developed as, uh, as George and Owen have previously described. The final step was to make all this data available to the uh, end users in the EOSC portal and specifically in the uh, uh, EOSC marketplace. The new version is currently deployed uh, and uh, you may ask what changed. Uh, actually, the, the main uh, priority for us was to uh, be ready to uh, ask, uh, to, to answer this question, uh, even though it, um, it uh, does not directly come to us. So our pr priority would be to, uh, was to create an intuitive uh, user interface uh, that would show the uh, new set of data uh, curated in the resource profile 3.0 to the end users and uh, make sure that they are aware of how the, uh, the resource uh, profiles changed, what is the new data uh, that are available and coming from the providers. Uh, in order to um, uh, in order to be sure that uh, our end users uh, are aware of the uh, of the quality of the data set collected by the onboarding team, we crafted the new presentation layer for for the uh, for the data uh, collected uh, with the provider component. Um, but th there were some challenges, uh, specifically uh, handling the metadata quantity, uh, because as you uh, know, as uh, resource providers, there's a large data set collected in the onboarding process and the variability of this data. So, uh, so the situation in which some of the data uh, are optional once they are introduced by providers in the onboarding process. Uh, at the right side of my slide, you can see the current uh, uh, the current uh, look of the service um, or resource presentation page in the EOSC portal, uh, and the pop up that is. Uh, Mm, shown to the user who enters this layout for the first time. We developed some uh, mini framework that will take the user uh, through the new layout and uh, show exactly how, how uh, the layout changed and how to access the newly available information, uh, uh, which was made available uh, with the evolution of resource profile. 
Um, the first step of this of this uh, mini tutorial will show uh, the evolution of the of the top uh, section. So we collected all the uh, main information in the in the top section, uh, making it the main uh, point to to look at uh, once you enter the resource uh, presentation page. Uh, then all the categorization and uh, and uh, target users and uh, resource availability and uh, supported languages information is collected uh, at, at the right side of, of the presentation layout. Uh, then the user is shown with uh, the description and the resource offers uh, provi provided by the providers. And the next step is to take the users to the newly created details page that will uh, show all the information uh, that is input by the provider uh, during the onboarding process. Uh, so as you can see, the journey that starts from the provider component and the user interface that has been already presented by George ends up uh, in the uh, user interface of Marketplace. These 12 categories uh, you can see at, at the left side uh, in the screenshot of the provider component are translated to the uh, details section in the uh, uh, resource presentation page in the EOSC marketplace. Mm. At the end of this, of this mini guide, uh, we uh, also prepared some uh, way to gather feedback about the new look and the quality of the data uh, provided by, by service providers. Mm, and what I want to emphasize uh, here is that uh, mere software development uh, is nothing uh, in the scope of creating uh, uh, EOSC. Uh, the support of EOSC portal uh, is showing uh, the users uh, the information provided by service provide providers, but the quality of information is something that creates uh, valuable content and valuable service catalog and the basis to, uh, to create a marketplace. Our main goal uh, here is to uh, make this conversation uh, between service providers and, and uh, resource providers and resource users available. Uh, um, and uh, we are uh, trying to uh, listen closely to the voice of, uh, of both sides. Uh, one of the, one of the feedback mechanism, uh, mechanisms deployed in this new release version is, is, the, uh, is the final step of this mini guide that I am showing you right now uh, that will allow also to, um, to check the tick if, uh, if a user wants to be uh, asked about uh, more information uh, in regard to the, uh, to the satis satisfaction uh, in accessing the resource uh, description. Uh, we will take into account feedback about the, the quality of designs, but uh, we also want to make sure that we are uh, able to determine if, if, the, if the data provided by providers is enough uh, for the users to, uh, mm, to find out use, useful information about the service, to determine if the service is usable for, the resource is usable for them uh, and the quality of the information is uh, correct. Uh, in the um, process uh, of user experience modeling uh, that is uh, carried out in the EOS Enhanced project, we also take other steps to, uh, to address the, uh, 
end user perspective of of the um, of the uh, youth portal usage uh, we take user surveys uh, both uh, in the community of EOSC uh, users and EOSC providers we use other feedback tools as as the one um, presented already by the by by Owen uh, we have some other tools to monitor uh, how the users interact and even some tools to uh, present uh, different versions of, of the user interface to the users in order to find out uh, if, they, if they find the information uh, that is needed to evaluate, to discover uh, resources in the most uh, intuitive form. Uh, I'll come back to the previous slide. Uh, I, I would like to stress out uh, the fact that uh, we are uh, a community that uh, that is created with end users and end providers. And uh, personally, I think that uh, something created uh, between these two groups, uh, one providing the resources and other uh, consuming the resources is something that creates, uh, uh, creates uh, EOSC. Mm. We should be able as uh, EOSC portal developers uh, to uh, address, uh, address the perspectives of both in order to make sure that, that we make the most uh, to support uh, one side reaching the other. And this is our main goal in this uh, whole process. Uh, I will com come back to this in the conclusions, but I want to uh, present some more features that are uh, avail made available in this uh, software release we launched be in be in before. Uh, EOSC Expo conference. Uh, one thing that you can uh, find out in the EOSC portal uh, that is new is the user profile. So the place where the user can um, tell the portal, tell the, tell the uh, platform about their interests and, uh, and categories uh, of interests. Uh, as well as scientific domains of interest and sign up to notifications about new re relevant uh, uh, services and resources uh, that come to the EOSC portal. That's how uh, we try to animate the um, engagement of the users uh, to, the, to the inclusion of the new, new uh, resources in the onboarding process. What, is, what are the next steps? The next steps uh, will, will be uh, developing recommendations for the users. These are two versions of the uh, pro prototype user interface uh, we, we developed, we designed, and we will find out uh, which, which one uh, of them is most, most suitable, running some tests and analytics. But what is the reason? The reason here is to increase resource findability mm. uh, by suggesting uh, compatible resources by increasing search accuracy. Uh, we are hoping to uh, give the providers a tool uh, to um, increase uh, the potential uh, to make the resources findable. Uh, we want to promote resource value. Uh, as the way to support an excellent research. As we believe that, um, the value of the resource is the, if, is the uh, dry, driver of the uh, resource market. And I know that market is, uh, is a complicated term and uh, maybe uh, contro controversial in the uh, standpoint of science, but uh, when we uh, have uh, some supply and we have some demand, uh, there is uh, natural market created, even though that uh, no one buys resources. 
and we want to increase user satisfaction as the as the user uh, component uh, developers as the representatives of the uh, EOS portal uh, demand side. Uh, what are the promotion factors in the uh, uh, recommendations? These might be user interests or used by other users with similar interests, similar similarity of resources, so information devoted from provider suggestion or classification, and this can be also resource value. So our vision is that uh, ES portal should pro promote uh, resources that present value. And there are inevitable challenges uh, connected with this approach because uh, we need to know how to measure a resource value. We, we have some ways to uh, understand what can be a value of resource. We have, have some uh, rating features, opinions. Uh, we will have some favorite functionality. We can uh, analyze popularity uh, of resources but does it really mean that uh, popular services are, uh, or resources are valuable? We can, uh, we can try to understand different uh, resource description fields su such as uh, technology readiness level and try to, uh, try to use it as uh, indicators of resource value. But this is uh, something that is not really obvious. Uh, and this is something that, from my perspective, uh, US resource providers, US resource users can help us to understand what creates a value for the resource providers, what, what are the valuable services and what are uh, for, for the resource providers and what are valuable services for the resource users. And measuring user satisfaction, so uh, satisfying use of resources and uh, and uh, measures strictly connected with the recommendation uh, panels. Uh, how satisfactory are the recommendations uh, presented by the EOS portal? Uh, so to wrap up, uh, I would like to uh, end this uh, presentation with with the mission of the uh, EOSC marketplace and the view of uh, how uh, we as EOSC uh, community are creating EOSC portal. Uh, the role of EOSC marketplace to us is to help creating demand and supply driven environment for pan-European promotion of resources for excellent science. For provider, it is, uh, it is there to help make uh, the resource discoverable to help fighting information bubbles in pan-european uh, infrastructures so the users don't uh, stick in their information bubbles uh, and can reach uh, most of the services provided by european european commission at the pan-european level uh, and with other EOS core components, uh, our mission is to uh, help providing uh, ready to use tools for professional resource de delivery. This uh, connects strictly with the service management si uh, system. And, uh, and we as uh, EOS marketplace developers uh, are hoping to uh, find our role here. And for the end users, uh, the role of, of the uh, EOSC marketplace is to help in discovery of excellent resources of user interest, finding the valuable and usable information and helping in accessing them by the end users. So as a summary, I, I want to add that uh, we will be uh, uh, trying to uh, address all these goals. And there is an inevitable role of providers around the onboarding process uh, in, in creation of EOSC portal. And I hope to uh, leave this presentation with uh, 
uh, with uh, some incentive to help us create uh, this portal. Thank you. Thanks, Patosh. <clears throat> um, I think we've had quite a complete view of what's going on with the, with the portal now. Uh, that was an interesting talk. Particularly, I would pick up right at the kind of near the end of it. This question of quality is, I think, a really uh, difficult but necessary one in terms of how are we going to define quality. Uh, it's not for us to determine what every researcher needs, but we want to give them some idea of, of the benefit of using different resources than else. So this is something that I think is on the table for the next phase of discussion and not just kind of technical quality measures, but how do we go beyond that? However, we are basically uh, at the end of the time. Uh, I didn't see any questions that were unanswered in the chat. There were a couple of questions which I think I tried to answer and then Mark van der Sanden answered better than I could. Um, if you have any other questions, certainly I think any of us would be happy to receive them by email. Um, or you can, as I said, use the various feedback mechanisms that are in integrated with the OSC portal. So this new feedback button on the right or the, the surveys and the schemes which Bartosz presented as well. Um, on that note, I think unless uh, there's anything any of my fellow panelists would like to say, anything that you guys would like to add? No? Uh, I think we can, uh, we can call a halt. It's time for your coffee break before we uh, come back for the next set of uh, breakout sessions. Uh, sorry, the next plenary session after the break, which being about uh, architecture uh, and interoperability is probably also quite related to a lot of the things we've talked about today. Okay, thank you very much. See you after the break. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Owen. Bye.